Good evening and welcome to Northampton High School. My name is Nicole LaChapelle. I'm the treasurer of the Massachusetts Democratic Party. We have a few housekeeping uh, items and uh, a few announcements and then we'll get way with the governor's uh, forum of our Democratic candidates. We'd like to welcome tonight the vice chair of the Democratic Party, Deb Kozakowski. Hampshire County Register of Deeds, Mary Olberding. Northwestern District Attorney, David Sullivan. Former Congressman, John Olver. <laughs> Mayor David Narkowitz of Northampton. Former Mayor of Northampton, Mary Claire Higgins. We, for housekeeping items, if you're in need, need of interpretive services, we have an interpreter right here to the left and seats available. We'd also like to thank the Northampton High School Theater Tech, um, Ryan, Chuck, Jonah, Abby, Connor, Saldia, Dan, and Dominic. Thank you very much. You've been great to work with. For those of you who've just walked in, there are seats still remaining up in the balcony, or if you're standing in the back and want a seat or cannot see from where you're standing, there are tons of seats upstairs, and we encourage you to go upstairs and make yourself comfortable. Uh, my last um, announcement from before I introduce our next speaker is that if you like this event and you want to find out more about great Democratic candidates on February 12th, the Northampton Democratic City Committee is sponsoring a similar forum right up the street at JFK Middle School of, whoops, here we go, Attorney General, uh, Lieutenant Governor and Treasurer candidates, um, and it'll be on the 12th at 7 p.m. in the community room at JFK. So we encourage you to attend that and learn more about our great Democratic candidates. The person I bring to the microphone next is new to the position, but very old to democratic politics and stands for values that are as old as the Democratic Party. He's our new chairman, Tom McGee, Senator from Lynn Mass. Thank you very much, Nicole, and uh, welcome to, be, to all of you tonight. Uh, and for the talk uh, that I continue to hear that people aren't interested in the uh, races that are coming up. Uh, it's great to see a full house here tonight. On Saturday I was down in Plymouth and I arrived at 9.15 for a 10 o'clock event and the parking lot was full and we couldn't get in the door. So people, and the people were here to hear Democratic candidates, all of the candidates, uh, and, and listen to the things that we believe are going to move this Commonwealth forward. So I'm honored to be here. I've been on the Democratic State Committee for uh, 37 years since I was five years old. Uh, and. Uh, so I'm really committed, but I, I grew up in a Democratic family. My father was in the legislature, and he, he learned from his mother, who was, uh, seven, was a young teenager working in the shoe factories in Lynn and was part of the uh, union organi organizing that went on then, that getting involved, being a part of the process, and being involved as a Democrat can change our lives and change the lives of the people in our communities that we all live in. So I'm excited about the opportunity to be chair of the party. I look forward to working together. We have, with all of these great candidates you're going to hear from tonight, because they have, uh, well, they'll be talking about the vision we have to continue what the work that we've uh, seen over the last eight years from the Patrick administration, almost eight years, and they're going to, you're going to hear from them about their vision for the future of the Commonwealth. Uh, and uh, starting on February 8th, there's over 515 caucuses <laughs> statewide, where thousands of people are going to come together and uh, uh, choose their right to be involved. Thousands of people are going to come out and talk about the things we believe in, get ready to go to the convention in Worcester on June 13th and 14th. Uh, you can learn more about the Democratic Party. Go to massdems.org. Uh, we look forward to your involvement in this process. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce Jim Madigan, who will be moderating tonight's forum. Thanks for being involved. Make sure that you get and stay involved. And I know when you hear these candidates, you're going to know that the Democratic Party is the future of Massachusetts. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, Senator.
We have a pretty simple format tonight. One minute opening statements. The candidates will be starting in alphabetical order. That order will then rotate throughout the evening. I'll be asking six questions gathered by the organizing committees from the community. Those questions are in your program. The candidates were advised of them in advance. Our panel of journalists will ask a total of 10 questions they have prepared. The candidates don't know those questions. Then we'll have closing statements. We ask you to please hold your applause or any comments so that we'll have time for all of the scheduled questions. Our panelists are Susan Kaplan from WFCR Radio 88.5. <laughs> Stan Moulton, Night Managing Editor of the Daily Hampshire Gazette. And Laura Hutchinson, reporter and anchor for WWLP 22 News. Finally, before we get to our questions, and I bet you're going to break the rule on uh, trying to keep things uh, quiet, holding your applause or any comments so that we have time, our candidates are Joseph Avalone, Donald Berwick, Martha Coakley, Steve Grossman, and Juliet Cahan. Let's give them a round of applause now. Thank you. We so appreciate them coming to spend an evening with us here in Western Massachusetts. Opening statements now, again, in alphabetical order. One minute each. Mr. Avalone. Thank you, Jim. I'm running for governor because I love Massachusetts, and I want to give back. I went into surgery 30 years ago because I wanted to help people. I met my wife Sandy, a Worcester resident, and we've raised three wonderful children. And I believe that my unique background and ability to get results is what we really need now in our Commonwealth. I've been running for a year, 129 cities and towns and over 400 events, and I've seen a very different Massachusetts. Thousands of people that I've talked to don't think that politics as usual is working for them. The needs of the middle class are not being met. I am not a Beacon Hill politician, and this is no time for politics as usual. The next governor faces two critical tasks, to create thousands of jobs in a world economy and to control our health care costs, the highest in the world. I am the only candidate that's done both of those things, and I believe I can be the leader we need now for our Commonwealth. I ask for your support, and I thank you for being here tonight. One minute, Mr. Berwick. I'm Don Berwick. Uh, I'd like to be your governor. I'm a pediatrician and an executive. Uh, I started, and for 20 years I ran what's now one of the largest nonprofit organizations in the world, working on health care improvement. And then President Obama asked me to come to Washington to run Medicare and Medicaid. That's an agency with a budget larger than the Pentagon's. Uh, the Republicans opposed me. Glenn Beck called me the second most dangerous man in America. But, <laughs> but the uh, President stuck by me. I went to Washington. I served. And now I'd like to be governor. Uh, and that's because with Washington and gridlock, and the public losing trust in itself and our government, uh, this is a time in which the nation badly needs a beacon, a beacon that shows that a progressive agenda can deliver for people. Um, Massachusetts should be that beacon. We're the first state to make health care a human right. We're the first state to say you can marry the person you love. We are a state with compassion. I grew up in a very small town, and in that town, when you're driving along the side of the road and someone's broken down, you stop your car and you say, can I help you? That is my philosophy of government. We need government that fights for compassion Time, and sir. social justice and Time. equality, and that'll Time. be my fight. Thank you very much. One minute, Ms. Coakley. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. I'm Martha Coakley. I believe the next governor of Massachusetts has to make sure this economy turns around for everybody, not just those at the top, not just Wall Street. It's why I took on the fight against the big banks to keep people in their home and prevent unnecessary foreclosures. It's why in talking to a young man who uh, was learning English and had a full-time job but couldn't make ends meet, had to drop his class so he could take two jobs. We need to increase the minimum wage and we need to give earned sick time to people uh, who deserve it. I also believe that as our kids need to be prepared to compete in a global economy, they need early pre-K education. Uh, we need a longer and more structured school day and we need to have a system that lets every kid reach his or her potential. And finally, although we have great physical health care here in Massachusetts, we're working on the costs. We need to reduce the stigma and provide access for everybody who needs mental health care, like my brother Edward, who 18 years ago committed suicide because he did not get treatment. Thank you. I'd like to be your governor. One minute, Mr. Grossman. 
I'm going to take 10 seconds of my minute to ask for a moment of silence for one of the great warriors for social and economic justice this country has ever had, and that's Pete Seeger, who died just within the last 24 hours. I was asked the other day, Steve, who's your political hero? And I responded, Franklin Roosevelt, greatest president of the 20th century. Because in 1937, in the middle of the worst economic times of our lifetime, Franklin Roosevelt said the following. He said, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, but whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Too few jobs, too little education, too little health care, too little hope, and too little dignity. What makes me proud to be a Democrat every day of my life, what makes me proud to be a candidate for governor, is as long as there is a single friend, neighbor, or colleague who lacks a job, education, hope, health care, or dignity. Our fight is not over. That's my fight. That's why I'm running for governor. Thank you very much. One minute, Ms. Kayem. Thank you. And it's um, Kayem. And I, here's how you remember it. I am for Kayem. Very easy. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Just a thought. Uh, my name is Juliet Kayyem, and there are many ways to describe me. I'm a mother of three children and a wife. I've been a public servant for most of my career, uh, serving for a young assistant attorney general named Deval Patrick as a civil rights attorney, and then as his Homeland Security Advisor, and then uh, for President Obama as Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, those jobs are the basic tenets of the Democratic Party. They are about progressive politics, opening doors, shaking things up getting access, and they are about investments in our communities, transportation, infrastructure, keeping us safe and secure from whatever the challenges are, whether climate change guns or, or people who do harm. The leadership skills I bring to this in state and federal government are complex and crisis, and that is what we need from uh, government today, to steer us forward to the most welcoming, the most prepared, uh, the most connected state that we know, and one that we will always uh, uh, value in Massachusetts. Thank you. Time. Thank you very much. Now the first community question. This is submitted by the organization Yes Northampton, and we'll go first to Mr. Berwick. Yes Northampton is looking to the incoming governor to lead a campaign for progressive state tax reform in order to provide adequate revenue for education and other public services. What is your plan to do that? I'm completely with you. Any candidate for governor that looks at our education, our infrastructure, our, ba our backlog, and the social safety net, Mike. Mics are not on. I think we have to be very close and directly on to the mics, perhaps. Thanks. I support this uh, idea. Any candidate for governor that looks at our education, infrastructure, uh, defects in our safety net is going to have to take a stand that we need sources of revenue in this commonwealth to shape the kind of community and commonwealth that we want. There are three sources from my point of view. One is health care reform. Uh, our health care system is the most expensive in the nation, and it's highly wasteful. I'm the only candidate that's put single-payer health care on the table, and it's partly to return money to you so you, we can use it for our communities. Second is, uh, is uh, tax loopholes and, and, and exemptions. They are, they've taken over a lot of our budget. A lot of them make no sense. I want to reset the button on that to zero. Tax loopholes that provide jobs or support the safety net, I will support. Others are not in play. And the third is we need tax policy that's fair in this commonwealth, which means that if you're, if you're at the low end of the income spectrum, your income tax rate should be lower. And if you're at the high end of the income spec spectrum, tax rate should be higher. And I will work in that direction in this commonwealth with you and with anyone that will support that. Ms. Coakley, a minute. Thank you. So I believe the operative principle here has to be that we cannot increase the tax burden on those who can afford it the least, and that as we look at this issue as how we provide for investing in the things we care about, the things we want to do in Massachusetts, it includes our education, our infrastructure. Uh, you know, and we're going to talk about that tonight, all those things that we want to and need to pay for. I believe that we need to first make sure that as revenues turn around, that we do it at the state level, increase those revenues from expanding the economy, that we help you do that at the local level. I think we've done our bit trying to keep people in their homes and uh, uh, make sure that we turn around the housing situation so you have more uh, income at the local level. And we do need to look at uh, issues like earned uh, income tax credits, uh, as Don Berwick said, what those loopholes are, and make sure that the tax code is fair. I do not want to increase the burden, however, on anybody who can't afford it. And Mr. Grossman. I think the first thing we need to do is to define what our priorities are and what we want to invest in. For me, it's universal pre-K, increasing our funding for higher education, 
mental health services, behavioral health services, substance abuse programs, a 1% green budget for the first time since 2001, and investing in our vocational technical schools. Those cost money. So there are four ways in which you can fund them. First of all, grow the economy dynamically and create more revenue. Second of all, save money, and I have a track record of doing that as state treasurer, having saved tens of millions of dollars on our way to saving $100 million a year at the state public pension system. Third, public-private partnerships. And fourth, I will not rule out seeking additional revenue, but if we do seek additional revenue, let's make sure we do tax reform so that we increase exemptions for lower and middle-income families so they are held harmless from any increase in taxes. That's how you make the system more progressive, more fair, and more appropriate for all the people of Massachusetts. Ms. Cayenne. Uh, Governor Patrick tried to reform the tax code in Massachusetts, and I agreed with him in that effort. Uh, but he was unsuccessful. Uh, so in the meanwhile, we need to look at other options that are available to the next governor. Uh, heeding his call when he re re uh, released this most recent budget, uh, that it will be incumbent on the next governor uh, to take this issue seriously and get it done. So how can we do that? First, uh, criminal justice. I mean this when I uh, say that it depresses me that if I were to become governor, I inherit a budget that envisions a billion dollars spent on prison construction by 2020. Uh, you know how to spend that money better, as do I. Uh, so we can begin to steer money in other social services. Uh, second, listening and supporting the mayors. What do mayors in your communities want? They need help with regional transportation authority and, and access for their communities to schools and jobs so that they, we increase their tax base of residents and businesses that then invest in their schools and infrastructure. Uh, so those are how I would generate revenue now while still taking on the tax fight. Thank you. Mr. Avalon. I certainly agree that we need to increase education. It's the future of our children. It's the future of our commonwealth. And there are many other services that have been cut back during the recession that we will need to replace as the economy starts to get better. I don't believe, though, that we should raise taxes. And I think I differ with my colleagues in believing that somehow we're going to raise taxes, have enough money to do these things, and not hit the middle class. We know it will hit the middle class. I don't want to do that. I do believe that we can make room for these important investments, including education, by controlling our health care costs. Right now, it's 40 percent of the state budget, 40 percent. If it's 39 percent of the state budget, that's $350 million that can go right to education. I'm going to control health care costs as a governor. We need to in our state. We need to even beyond our state budget. But that will create the room for the investments we need without raising taxes and which will not be an increasing burden on the middle class. Now, I will be back later in the program with five more community questions. We're going to go now to our panelist questions. The candidate asks the question, has one minute and 30 seconds to respond. Other candidates, one minute each for rebuttal or commentary. And the candidates, again, have not had any advance information on the panelist questions. First question from Susan Kaplan to Ms. Coakley. Attorney General Coakley. Uh, welcome and thank you to all of you. Questions about how you've handled campaign finances remain in the Boston Globe reports that you've replaced your sister as treasurer, but new questions have emerged. And tell us, why should Massachusetts voters trust you to oversee state government when you're struggling to manage the arguably smaller finances of your previous and present campaign? Sure. Well. First of all, I, I disagree with the premise that we struggled. The first that we heard about this uh, recently, we uh, immediately took on to correct it. Uh, in terms of the federal campaign, we have filed all of the amendments with the Federal Election Committee. Those have been accepted. Uh, that campaign account has been closed. There has been no further action in terms of that federal campaign account. Uh, I've acknowledged that uh, there was sloppiness involved in the bookkeeping, but there was no, from the Federal Election Commission's uh, action on this, uh, any uh, mismanagement of those funds. Uh, I appreciate that people expect, and I expect, uh, certainly as Attorney General and any candidate, to have the appearance and the actuality of propriety in all of our funding. Um, mistakes happen, and when we found out about it, we corrected them. Mr. Grossman, one minute to comment if you have any further comments or rebuttal on what Ms. Coakley has said? No, I would only say that in each of our cases, it's important that 
when the people of this Commonwealth ask us questions, we answer the questions directly and forthrightly. And I think that's what campaigns are all about. And so I think that uh, openness and accessibility and transparency is as important as anything in the office we hold or the ones we seek to hold. Ms. Kayyem. I want you to remember me and tonight uh, for what I believe and my vision for the state, not uh, my opinion about the Attorney General's finances. Mr. Avalon? Well, I, d I do believe that the, the governor, to be governor, needs to be completely transparent and open uh, with all of our citizens. And I believe that uh, the Attorney General will be that way uh, in making her explanation of what's, what's occurred. I know that she has certainly acted honorably as Attorney General, and I imagine if there are more questions that she will give the explanation that's necessary. And I think that's an important test uh, for governor, and I think that she will probably uh, proceed that way. Mr. Burrow, come in. Uh, I certainly take the Attorney General at her word, and I look forward to a campaign that's fair and we have dialogue, Martha. Uh, more generally, I want to say that it's, it is absolutely clear to me that in public service, as I think we all know and agree, the ethical standards have to be on reproach, and watching the misbehaviors in, among legislators here on occasion uh, or the, uh, the defects in management of, of uh, departments of government that really ought to be diligently uh, managed and accountable is, is not acceptable. We need absolutely top-level management and high-level ethics of the Commonwealth, and I think all five of us agree on that. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just apologize briefly to our candidates. If I didn't make the format here clear to you before, I'm sorry. Again, the reporter's questions will be directed at one of the candidates, but everyone will get to comment. I'm sure in some cases they'll be particular, in other cases not so much. So candidate asks the question, gets a minute and a half, and everyone else gets a minute for their own comment or uh, rebuttal. Next question will go first to Mr. Grossman, and will be from Stan Moult. Yes, the Massachusetts Democratic uh, Party platform calls for establishing a single-payer government-sponsored program like Medicare. How would you persuade the legislature to establish a single-payer health care system in Massachusetts? I'm glad you asked me the question because it gives me an opportunity to correct the record. Um, one of my uh, colleagues here on the platform has said consistently that he's the only person who has put single payer on the table. Uh, that's not accurate. I have put single payer on the table. Obviously the job of governor is to implement the laws that we have. Legislature last year passed something called Chapter 224 and it requires us to cap our health care expenditures by increasing them at no more than 3.6 percent uh, annually. Uh, and that's so what I would plan to do and look to do in a variety of ways, move health care from our acute care hospitals to our community health centers, which do a very fine job, to our community health institutions. We need more primary care physicians. We need to call, control the cost of prescription drugs. And we need to bring more wellness programs into our workplaces with incentives, because every dollar that's spent on wellness saves us $3.27. But I also think it's critical for us to take a serious look at what is going on in our state to the north, in our neighbor to the north. Vermont is the one state that has decided to implement single payer by 2017. Pete Shumlin is a good friend of mine. I look forward to working closely with him as governor to see how that's implemented. And I think we ought to take a very serious look at it. It is certainly a critical option. We should never take single payer off the table, not for a moment. Ms. Kayyem. Uh, like the treasurer, I too agree that uh, single payer is the way the world should be. Uh, and I commend uh, Dr. Berwick for uh, putting it on the table and, and his recommendation is to have a study that comes out with a review uh, within a year. Uh, but uh, I will fight for important causes for this state, but you always, as an executive, have to weigh that fight against other priorities. Uh, right now, we have 98% of our uh, citizens uh, with health insurance. That's a victory, because we have been far ahead. Uh, so the next fights uh, that I will take for you in healthcare are gonna be not single payer, but are gonna be about reducing uh, the rates uh, and how much medical costs are right now. Second, uh, talking seriously about public health. As, as a mother of three kids, I see it, right, about obesity and drug use and, uh, and alcohol use. And then supporting our community health centers that really are at the forefront of the intimacy that is so often lacking in health services, right? They are supporting our neighborhoods and communities. Thank you. Mr. Avalon, one minute. I don't support moving to single payer. We have a system in which everybody is insured, 97 plus percent in our state. It's a success. 
uh, is we've had it for seven years, it works. The next stage, which was always meant to be the second stage, is to keep it affordable. Whether we have single payer or multi payer, we would need to make these next steps. The costs have been going up in the public programs as much as they've been going up uh, with the private insurers. So we need to make it more affordable. That's where the next governor needs to spend the time working with all our major institutions. I've done that. Uh, when I was the chief operating officer of Blue Cross back in the 90s, we did control our health care costs in this state. I did work with all of our major institutions. I'm the only candidate that has controlled health care costs <coughs> and lowered them in Massachusetts. We will need to do that again, and I will, do, I will lead that effort as governor. That's where we should put our efforts, not refighting the political debate about, uh, about the insurance mechanisms, which we now have successfully in Massachusetts, at, which is a model for the nation. Mr. Berwick. I've worked for 30 years to pursue better care, better health, and lower cost, and I know what it looks like. I know what high-performing health care systems look like, and we can have it in the state. We do not yet have that, and it is, cost, it is costing us dearly. Every line item in the state budget is down over the past decade. Parks and recreation, local aid, higher education, there's only one that's up. It's health care, 59 percent up in the state budget, our $14 billion expenditure on health care. I led a single-payer system, Medicare. Uh, my overhead rate in running that $800 billion system, larger than the Pentagon budget, was 1 percent. Private insurers are arguing that the current standard of 15 percent overhead is too little for them to get their job done. There is billions of dollars available to us to recover, while we also simplify the lives of doctors and nurses who are driven crazy by the recording and the multiple formularies and coding systems, and by patients who, like me, cannot even read their bills. Single payer is the way to go in this state, and I definitely will authorize the day one when I'm governor a study that will show us a pathway to get there. Please. Please. Ms. Coakley, one minute. So in 2004, with a Republican governor and a legislature and business and labor uh, and, and payers and providers, there was a decision made that Massachusetts would embark on providing access for everybody, providing quality health care, and making sure the next step would be to get costs down. What our office has done over the last several years is look at why that market is expensive and why those costs were going up 8 to 10 percent a year, not affordable. And the current focus on changing that market so that people still have choice, quality, and access. Those three things are what this is about. And right now we are embarked in getting those costs down by looking at the marketing cloud, uh, marketing cloud of certain payers, making sure we move to more primary care. Uh, keeping those costs down, attacking uh, cost drivers like diabetes and asthma, and focusing on how we can provide better preventive care and better access to people. I do not believe that Massachusetts is ready to move. It does not rule it out, but we're not ready to do it yet. Thank you very much. Question now from Laura Hutchinson to uh, Juliet Kayam. Thank you. Ms. Kayam. There were a number of ports last year that highlighted the need for attention to be given to the Department of Transitional Assistance. One such report, it was actually a state audit, found the state paid more than $2 million in benefits to more than 1,100 people who had been dead anywhere from 6 to 27 months. Do you think more needs to be done to protect taxpayers' dollars mm -hmm. from waste or abuse? Absolutely. And uh, so let's begin uh, with who not to blame. Uh, it is the people who uh, are worthy and deserve many of these social services, right? It's not, and it's not just DTA, it's any uh, social service. And the obligation of Democrats in particular is the delivery of these social services, whether it is websites or whether it is a protection of children and families uh, in a in a good way, right? It's as simple as that. Because if we don't deliver social services that we believe in, in an efficient manner, in a way that saves taxpayer money but is humane and caring uh, to citizens who need it, uh, people will lose faith in the social service itself. And we fail them and the party fails them. So I am committed to the administering of these uh, services uh, uh, in, a, in, in the best way possible without blaming the recipients. And as someone who has been in operations all of my career, right, crisis situations, uh, situations in which you have to put the pieces together, uh, that is what I care about. It is not simply that Democrats can have good ideas or important social services. It is that we have to be able to provide government services in a way that works uh, for everyone. And I am committed to that and think uh, we can't complain enough when these systems fail because we're failing the recipients as well as the taxpayers. 
Mr. Avalone. The, this program is vital for, in our efforts to try and protect the most vulnerable citizens uh, in the Commonwealth. And we have to protect it, not only financially, but uh, the perception of it, so that it stays uh, viable in our Commonwealth. So I do agree with the audit. I'm glad we conducted the audit. I really applaud uh, the auditor, Suzanne Bump, for, for doing it. And uh, like any organization, when an audit like that comes to light, you follow it through, make the changes necessary. And I certainly know that uh, we are doing that and should be doing that. And I think we should have even more audits to follow up. I do think that the answer here lies in technology. I think the EBT cards, uh, we can use updated technology so it makes it very clear who's purchasing what with them. Think of what we all know based on the phones that we have today and what people know about us. Clearly technology is there. We can bring back the integrity of the system rather simply with the technology. And I think that we owe it to the, the good people who need this assistance and certainly the taxpayers as well to make, uh, make sure that it works with high integrity. Mr. Berwick. The challenge here is balance and maturity. I have no patience at all with fraud. When I went and ran Medicare and Medicaid for the President, we had major efforts going on in this nation under the Affordable Care Act and before to fight fraud, and the fraud was, uh, it was terrible. Uh, billions of dollars being taken that we returned to the public treasury with strike forces. We worked with the FBI, the Department of Justice, local law enforcement. We need to be diligent about that. But let's keep first things first. In our state, as in the nation, there are vulnerable people, hungry people, people without a roof over their heads, people who need us to be compassionate as a, as, a, as a commonwealth to help them. We need to fight fraud, but we absolutely must do it in a way that does not weaken the supports to our most vulnerable people. That would be overshooting. So I will argue for a balanced approach in which every step we take to fight fraud, we also make sure that we're not putting obstacles in front of the people in our state who are least able to, to handle those obstacles. We need to help people first. Ms. Koch. Ms. Coakley. So it's not just a question, though, of fighting fraud. It's a question of accountability. Uh, the governor gets paid by tax dollars. I, as your attorney general, get paid by tax dollars. I take that seriously. For every dollar that my office gets, we bring back 14. We're one of those agencies that does fight Medicaid fraud and, and got an award last year for doing that. Um, I want to make sure that we are accountable for those benefits because I agree with everybody on this stage. People who deserve them, who need them, should get them. And when there is fraud, as we brought cases against convenience store owners, for instance, who were getting their cut for uh, taking some of those EBT cards or those transitional assistance cards, and uh, prosecuting them and saying there'll be a deterrent for intentionally fraud, uh, committing fraud on the government. But the government itself has that responsibility. Uh, I agree with Joe that better technology and better management will help us do that, accountability by the government, by those who get those benefits, and we can accomplish that uh, if we put our minds to it, and taxpayers will be well served. Mr. Grossman. So as your state treasurer, I had the responsibility last year of actually overseeing the procurement to provide the Department of Transitional Assistance with the updated technology. And we did write into that procurement that we wanted to buy the most up-to-date technology that would deal with waste, fraud, and abuse to the extent that we can to protect taxpayer dollars. And I think we've given the Department of Transitional Assistance the technology they need. And if there are merchants, whether they're lottery agents or stores, that deal illegally and traffic in EBT cards, we should go after them appropriately, as the Attorney General has said. But I also agree a wholeheartedly with Don Berwick. We have 800,000 people on food stamps as we're sitting here tonight. A farm bill was just passed which is cutting food stamps and I applaud Jim McGovern for the work that he's doing to try to maintain that program in the farm bill. So we need to make sure that those who need the services, whether it's cash assistance or food stamps, get them. And for those people who need to be reined in, those merchants, we will go after them and prosecute them. Let's not Time, sir. deal inappropriately with those people who need the help. Thank you. Question now from Susan Kaplan to Mr. Avalone. Mr. Avalone, um, despite constant tweaks to standards-based testing and reform efforts. A large number of schools in cities like Springfield and Holyoke struggle mightily, and rural parts of western Massachusetts face very different but equally compelling obstacles. The phrase reducing the achievement gap is not new. We've all heard it before. So besides what has already been done, what will you as governor do to improve the state's schools and how will you pay for it? 
Thank you. I am the, uh, always the first candidate to actually publish my K through 12 plan on my website, including how to pay for it. Uh, so I ask everyone to take a look, but it has two key principles to it. The first is to close the achievement gap, which I think is our biggest and highest need and will be the highest priority of my administration. And the second is to make sure that every child who graduates is career and college ready. On the achievement gap, what I'm proposing is creating a fund in the legislature, my highest priority. We're not going to raise taxes to do it. We're going to do it by saving health care costs. That fund is going to be dedicated to the, for the at-risk schools, the ones that are lower performing, to funding pre-K and to lengthening the school day. Uh, we know that those things work, and uh, we know that if we hold these schools accountable with the right kind of leadership uh, and employ these things, that we will get better, and thousands of kids will be benefited. We know that if uh, kids are literate by the third grade, having been through pre-K, that they have a much higher chance of graduating. And we know that lengthening the school day works as well. Uh, I uh, also am uh, very um, intent on making sure that uh, we bring more vocational uh, training back into our traditional schools and, and also continue to implement the STEM uh, technology initiative for girls and for underrepresented minorities as well as young boys because it's true that uh, Half of the so-called STEM jobs, the ones that require some kind of a scientific discipline in the state, don't require a degree beyond high school. And those jobs are $68,000 good middle-class jobs. That's what we want uh, for many of our children as well. Time, sir. Thank you. Mr. Berwick. My education platform appeared a couple of days ago, and I hope people will study it. I think the thing that's driving me most about seeking this office is my concern about inequality in our society, the growing disparities. It's hard to find a single keystone policy arena, but if there is one, it's education. Schools are the on-ramp to success in our society, and we need to invest in them more than we're doing now. I don't think the way to do it is with carrot and stick incentives or demoralizing teachers with teaching to the test rules. I think we've overshot on that. The, the problem is not teachers. The solution is teachers. And my major investment as governor will be to support a teacher workforce that can grow in pride and joy it, learning from each other and, and being succeeding. We've seen it work in the Merkland School in Lowell. I've been studying it. There, here, the union and the, t and the administration got together. They invested in teachers' opportunities. That school was a level four school. When they started 18 months later, it was a level one school. That's the way to invest. Like the other candidates, I'm for pre-K investment as well as a universal entitlement in this state. And I think also business linkages to schools are key. Thank you. Ms. Coakley. So I think we all agree on what we should be doing, and we've had successes. If you look at some of our pilot schools, our innovation schools, our charter schools, we know the studies that say pre-K helps kids do better. We know the kids who can't read in the third grade aren't likely to succeed. They're going to fall off the map. I agree with Don that we start with teachers. Uh, talk to teachers about what they need and how they teach kids. And you visit schools like the University Park School that works with uh, the uh, 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 Clark University, uh, and you see in a building that's built in 1885, uh, groups of students who are learning geometry but are writing about it. And so they work with each other, they work with the teachers, and every one of those kids is planning to go to college at a time when 10, 15 years ago, none of them would have gone if they even finished high school. That is the kind of thing we can do here in Massachusetts. I, w I would say, how can we not invest in it? And we, it costs us too much money in our criminal justice system, in our social service system, when we don't do it. Mr. Grossman. So the skills gap in our older industrial cities, the gateway communities, the neighborhoods of some of our larger cities is about poverty. We need to take a look at the Chapter 70 funding formula. I had a conversation within the last couple of days with my dear friend Stan Rosenberg, who endorsed me for governor. And there is a work underway to take a look at the Chapter 70 formula to make it fair. And pre-K is something we all agree on, but let's understand, there's a waiting list of 25,000 kids. This year's budget, the one that just came out, only takes 1,700 children off that waiting list. That means there are still 23,300 kids who may not be reading fluently by the end of the third grade. How to pay for it? I think that was one of the questions. You either pay for it by growing the economy, by public-private partnership, by saving, or by not taking additional revenue off the table. And I will not take revenue off the table. And if we do that, it's got to be done in a fair, more progressive way to hold harmless those lower and middle-income families. Those are the ways to pay for it. Those are our priorities.
Thank you, sir. Ms. Kayyem. As a mother, and if I were to become governor, I have the same goals for our children. I want them to thrive. I want them to be happy. I want them to be creative. And I want them to stay in Massachusetts. Uh, and that is why we invest and have to invest uh, in, our, in our students. So it begins with universal pre-K. Uh, and it begins thinking creatively about how to fund it. Because anyone who's entered the public school system has kids knows that the gap that exists for those pre-Kers, who, those who had uh, uh, pre-K experience and those who didn't is a gap that doesn't get closed. So you either find new sources of revenue, you support private public partnerships, you support uh, community investments. But we are behind most other states now and we will not be competitive in a global environment. Our children will leave uh, to get jobs unless we commit to this now. And on the other end, we need to think about the higher, the 10th, 11th, 12th graders in terms of skills and development. Uh, and we have to think of education as um, an anywhere or any time education approach, not the four walls of a schoolroom. And I'm committed to that. Time, thank you very much. Uh, question from Stan Moulton. We'll go first to Mr. Berwick. Yeah, what is your position on any effort by the legislature to tie an increase in the minimum wage to changes in unemployment insurance, such as reducing the number of weeks that benefits could be collected from 30 to 26, or increasing the number of weeks a person needs to work from 15 to 20 to be eligible for benefits? I disagree with it. They're separate issues and should be treated that way. So I believe we need to elevate our minimum wage, and then we need to make sure that unemployment benefits uh, and other benefits like that or maintain it of, at a humane level. I don't believe those issues should be tied to each other. Uh, I, I frankly am puzzled that we even have, have to have a conversation in the state about raising the minimum wage. We must raise the minimum wage. When we look at the minimum wage proposals on the table today, we are actually talking about elevating the income of our lowest paid workers to just above the federal poverty line for a family of three. That's not a conversation that should be had in a compassionate uh, society. We have resources here. And remember, elevating the minimum wage, providing better working conditions for the people, especially at the lower end of the income ladder, it puts dollars in circulation. I had an event recently at a lovely restaurant uh, in Acton where the owner is on her own voluntarily offering a minimum wage uh, to uh, wait staff that don't, don't have an entitlement to the full minimum wage. She's doing it because, I said, why are you doing this? Because they take the dollars down the street they spend it at the store down the street, and the money comes back to me. It's, just, it's not just humane. It's part of the economic development of our commonwealth, and we should simply do that. Tying these together makes no sense to me. Ms. Coakley. So I met a couple who work at Logan Airport uh, cleaning airplanes. It's a tough job. She works all night. He works during the day. Uh, and even at those jobs at that salary, they cannot afford to pay for their rent and get to work, pay for their transportation, and feed their 16-year-old son. That's just wrong. That needs to change. That multinational corporation that uh, hires them is doing quite well, I am sure. And we can and should do it, and it should not be tied and used as leverage for those other issues, whether it's unemployment insurance. If there are business barriers, and I think we need to make our businesses as competitive as we can by decreasing our health care costs and our energy costs and looking at fairness to them uh, around a bunch of issues that they've talked about, but this is not apples and oranges, and I've been very clear that the minimum wage and, frankly, earned sick time should be given to people without having it be tied to that other compromise at this time or ever. Mr. Grossman. So I don't think it's simply a matter of should we tie them together or not. I think we'll all agree that they shouldn't be tied. The minimum wage should go up. The Senate passed an $11 minimum wage. I'd like to see the House take up the $11 minimum wage tomorrow if they could, pass it independently of anything else, and make it the law of the Commonwealth. I have no doubt the governor would sign it. But I'll go further than that. It's not just about tying them together. It's about declaring absolutely unequivocally as governor that if a bill came to my desk independently of minimum wage and it cut benefits from 30 weeks to something lower than that, we have the best benefits of any state in the country and I'm proud of that. Or if it increased the number of weeks of eligibility from 15 to something higher, I would veto that bill, send it back to the legislature and I would keep vetoing it until they realize that that is not the direction we go. Massachusetts maintains a high level of unemployment benefits. We should be proud of that. We should maintain it. That's a lifeline for so many of our families, particularly with the federal government having cut them. Ms. Kayyem. 
I can answer the question uh, quickly, which is they shouldn't be tied. It is, it is apples and oranges. It is, uh, it is an ir irrelevant discussion that is meant to undermine uh, why we're talking about raising the minimum wage and why we need to do it. Uh, the reason why is because it's not about them. It is about us. It is about us as a state and our capacity to move forward with everyone belonging towards that sort of future Massachusetts that's gonna be competitive in a global environment. For those who are too easily fall off, right, because they cannot afford, or some, something happens in their life that throws them off, right? Uh, having an adequate minimum wage keeps them at the table and engaged in the state. It's about us. As governor as well, though, I have to commit to economic growth. It is not just about raising wages, it is the jobs that those wages, you know, that people work in. So we have to equally be committed to economic growth in the states for Massachusetts jobs, right? For the jobs that will come here and create a business-friendly environment so they stay here. And Mr. Avalone. Well, I absolutely agree, as I think everybody does, that we need to raise the minimum wage. We need to do it as soon as possible. I agree with the Senate bill to bring it to $11. I think it's a failure of the system that we have people working full-time jobs and living in poverty in our state. And the one thing I would add to that is many of them are in large companies who essentially are creating value for their shareholders on the backs of these poor people. That's not right. We shouldn't have it. I would not tie it to any kind of reform with the unemployment uh, insurance tax system because when you tie things together in the legislation, legislature, often nothing gets done. And we can't afford it, especially with the minimum wage, to not get it done. Question now from Laura Hutchinson. We'll go first to Ms. Coakley. Ms. Coakley, this is a question about spending efficiently. Uh, one thing that makes our state unique is we're a right to shelter state. However, there is a large homeless population in our state right now, and right now we're paying $3,000 a month per family to house thousands of families in hotels and motels. And this affects a number of communities here in Western Massachusetts. I wanna know what you think about the decision to house families in hotels, and what would be your plan to help families move into more secure housing, more stable long-term environment quicker? Sure, well that's, that's clearly a Band-Aid that's more expensive than it is helpful. Uh, it is what happens when uh, budgets are short and we don't have the ability or haven't taken time to invest or think about it. Um, I think it's important that we look at what the source of the homelessness is because I think the solutions for them are different. For instance, I think it's a shame that in Boston we have a home, uh, a center for homeless veterans. I, I think that in this day and age that we have veterans who've served our country who are without homes, uh, is a disgrace. So that is one issue. How do we look at those homeless vets and is that related to either behavioral or mental health issues, which may be in other parts of the population, uh, or substance abuse issues that we also need to address before we can find good permanent housing for them. I think we have an issue with homeless children uh, and so that has to be done better than I think our DCF has been doing it. And the third issue where people have lost their homes because of the foreclosure crisis, because they've uh, lost equity in their homes and they've been foreclosed upon. Those are people with proper counseling, financing, we may be able to get back into homes. But that should be a goal for the governor, for the legislature, for everybody in this audience to say, how are we going to decrease, if not eliminate, homelessness in Massachusetts and put the focus on uh, particular uh, groups of people to see what the solution is. Mr. Grossman. So the numbers that you cited actually equate to $46 million a year that we are spending in taxpayer dollars to cover those families that are in motels. And it's not just the money that we spend. Obviously we would like to save the money. But I think about those children who are with their families, their mom, in that motel. Think about how they've been yanked out of their school, yanked out of their safe place, and living in a community that they're not familiar with. That's part of the tragedy of all this. So there are several ways to deal with it. First of all, we've got to bring back a much more significant commitment to vouchers. If it's not coming from the federal government, which will cut them dramatically, we should provide them at the state level. Those vouchers, those housing vouchers could matter. Second, we've cut our three-year voucher program to two years. We should bring it back to a three-year to stabilize those families. And third, we should use some of the funds that we're gonna have as a result of the new housing bond bill when it's finally law and put that money to fixing up units to put those families in permanent housing once and for all. Ms. Kayan. 
So this is uh, sometimes seems like an intractable problem, but certainly we can learn solutions from community efforts uh, being made in communities throughout the state. I have served in the executive branch in the state, visiting 351 cities and towns, and as part of the campaign, I have learned uh, two things. Uh, the first is a uh, support and focus on increasing uh, and stabilizing the voucher program. We shouldn't view it as long term. We need to view it as, as just a, an investment in keeping people housed, because once they are on the street, uh, all is lost, essentially, especially for the children. Uh, but secondly, we need to think about affordable housing. Uh, and this is where we're one state, many solutions. So you talk to the Boston mayor, and it's all about trying to get affordable housing in the city. You talk to other mayors outside of Boston or in some of the gateway cities, and it's about uh, getting a, a stronger residential tax base in the city and affordable housing outside of it, and then a governor can provide uh, support for regional transportation authorities. So what I can vow on affordable housing is to listen to the solutions that mayors have and come to a solution for everyone. Thank you. Mr. Avalon. It's a tragedy that homelessness has been increasing in recent years. Certainly the economy plays into it, but also the state has cut back on certain things that have made some of the populations that are now homeless much more vulnerable to it. And it's, uh, and the, the, the biggest tragedy is the families that are involved. I think Steve uh, was very eloquent in describing what that means to a child. So we have to increase uh, our efforts. Uh, and some of it needs to go back to the root causes. Uh, the root causes for these, vulnerable, for these populations are many. I had the uh, privilege of being on the board of uh, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless for six years. That took care of 12,000 homeless people in the Boston area. I'm sorry to say it's up to 12,000. Uh, mental medical needs. The, the mental health needs that are not being addressed. The substance abuse needs that are not being addressed. And yes, sometimes the veterans, returnings, whose needs are not being addressed. Uh, create a large part of this population that then puts more pressures on families when they fall out of housing uh, that they don't have the, 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 the housing ability. So we have got to do more. We've got to do more to get at the root causes in particular, and that will solve the problem eventually. Thank you, sir. Mr. Berwick. In the uh, nonprofit organization that I started and led, I got very interested in homelessness a number of years ago. Uh, in the world of improvement, quality improvement, that's part of my three decades of background, there's one important number, and that's zero. Uh, bold goals in which you try to fix problems no one ever thought we could fix before. For me, homelessness is such a problem. I think it's a time for vision and very bold agendas here. Working, for example, the Roseanne Haggerty, a MacArthur Award, uh, Genius Award winner, uh, she's established a 100,000 homes project across the United States aiming for zero chronic homelessness, and it can be done. Uh, I think the underlying causes are met many. The work on substance abuse and mental health services is absolutely key to ending homelessness. But as governor, I would put that goal on the table. I don't see why we should be a state that calls itself compassionate, has the wealth of knowledge and industry and ambition that we do, and not tolerate even one single family homeless, and that would be my goal. Susan Kaplan, now a question that will go first to Mr. Grossman. Mr. Grossman. Um, would you support a casino in your hometown? And what would you say to those residents living in cities where a casino is likely to be built, like Springfield, right, which is right down the street, um, who don't want it there? So if you asked me, and you did ask me, I did. would I support? <laughs> I did. Would I, would, I, would I vote for a casino in my hometown? The answer is I would not. Having said that, there is no city or town in Massachusetts that will have a casino that did not vote by majority to have casinos. They took a look at the pros and the cons, and there are many in this audience who would obviously say those are not a good investment. Right, I'm talking to the others in the question. Mm -hmm. Right, but I mean, those in Springfield, look, we, we believe in majority rule. We believe that the majority in any community uh, the reason I think the people of Springfield voted that they wanted MGM to come to Springfield is that they believed that the jobs that would come to them in a very, you know, city with high levels of unemployment uh, would benefit the people of the community. They believed that the revenues they would gain would enable them to invest in housing and health care and education. So when the people of a community say, we're willing to accept it, understanding the serious problems that attend it, understanding the gambling addiction and other things that attend it, but on balance saying the jobs and the revenue are going to improve the quality of life in our community, uh, then I say to the residents of that community, if you've made that decision and a majority of you say that, 
uh, we're going to accept that and we're going to move forward and do the best we can to make sure that the city benefits and that the Commonwealth benefits in terms of jobs and in terms of revenue to spend on other important services. Ms. Kayan. I think it's a mistake to view the casino legislation as simply being majority rule. When the governor came in uh, to office facing a tremendous recession and looking at what over 35 other states were doing to generate revenue, uh, he put into place with the legislature a rigorous piece of legislation uh, that had more safeguards than majority rules. First, it maxed out the number of casinos that would be in the state, just three. So we're not Atlantic City, we're not Las Vegas. Second, the community involvement, right? Which isn't just the vote, it is actually communities getting together to figure out whether they want it, need it, working with the private sector. And third, that some of those revenues would go to public safety and security, the police officers I often worked with and others, uh, to ensure that communities, even those individuals who voted against it, would not uh, 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 be harmed by any potential. Fourth, I guess I should say this work. There is a commission that is so rigorous that some people wonder whether there will actually ever be a casino. That rigorousness is exactly what the legislation envisions. So there's lots of safeguards. Thank you, uh, Mr. Avalon. I think the uh, casinos, when they, uh, when the bill was passed, the revenues were oversold and the costs were underestimated. And in my community, I would not vote for it. Um, I do think the law was carefully considered. It does allow for local control and very rigorous uh, due diligence and vetting from the Gaming Commission as well. So I think we should allow the law to play out. And uh, what that means uh, is if there's a community in which there's going to be a casino, I think you have to be realistic that the costs are going to be somewhat higher there around addiction services, that there is going to be more pressure on small businesses in the area. Uh, and that the jobs that are going to be there for the long term are not the middle class jobs that we really need to build our economy around. And so I think the local community has to uh, accept that. We are a democracy. I think democracy uh, you know, should prevail. And we should just start to pay more attention to the cost in those communities where it is going to happen. Mr. Berwick. I'm against casinos and for the repeal. Um, I think it's a very bad deal for the state. Uh, it will hurt small businesses, and we know this because it has hurt small businesses in the states that allow casinos in. It will increase DUI and petty crimes in the area, causing deterioration of neighborhoods. There is an overestimate in the revenue benefit to the Commonwealth. Uh, it is absolutely for sure the casino will cannibalize the lottery revenue to a tune of several hundred million dollars, so the projection re additional revenue is overestimated. And perhaps most importantly, it will end a, it'll add a whole new public health burden to this Commonwealth. Uh, a mental health problem, families devastated by gambling addiction. It is a very bad deal and the wrong way to go. And I must say, I also fear that uh, the casinos entering our state almost inevitably will push us toward online gambling, which has happened in many other states, and I just think that's even worse. So I, do, I think it's a bad move. The cost's not worth the benefit, and there are other ways to, uh, to add to our economy and the uh, revenues we need, both public and private. Ms. Coakley. So the first, the first question is easy because I live in Medford and we don't have room for one. Sorry, I don't think anybody wants to put one there and we won't. Um, the, on the second that question, you vote for it? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just to get your answer. There, 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 if, 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 if there was a vote, would you vote for it? There, there won't be one in Medford. Is my point. I don't live in a community that would, anybody would want to put one in, or would host one. I'm answering your question. I said it was moot, but not to. On the second question, which I think is more interesting, is, you know, our legislature voted for casinos. My position at the time was, it's not the first place that would have gone for economic development. I think there are, knowing what my colleagues in New Jersey and uh, in Nevada, frankly, have dealt with, uh, they are expensive. Uh, they are, uh, we had no money laundering statute in Massachusetts, so I said if we're going to do this, we need money laundering statute. But the point is this, once local communities got to vote, many of them said no, and now this court will decide whether the people of Massachusetts will get to repeal that or not. And so we'll see what happens, but this is what democracy is about, and this discussion is a good one, I think. Ms. Coakley, one of the kind of neat parts about being moderators is you can be really nasty sometimes. And if, if you move to another community or if something happened to change things in Medford, do you have an idea of if you would vote A or nay? Uh, <laughs> I, I would probably vote no personally. Thank you very much. Our next question, Stan Moulton, will uh, go to Ms. Kayan. Legislation to tighten the state's gun regulations is 
expected this year, reflecting the recommendations from the gun violence task force, which was appointed by the House Speaker. Among the possible changes are tougher sentences for criminals who use illegal firearms in committing a crime, creating a system of universal background checks and reforming the state's licensing process, and increased disclosure of state mental health records for anyone seeking a firearms permit. Which of these measures would you support, and more generally, how would you make gun control a priority for your administration? Thank you for that, because uh, for anyone who thinks about the safety and security of our communities and risk reduction, you think about things like climate change and you think about guns, uh, because that's what's killing our children. Uh, so all of those provisions uh, is, are, are something that I would pursue. I actually think, though, of the priorities uh, that the loophole for gun show purchases is an area where this state could advance, this is where it's good to be a progressive state, could advance further than the federal government without bumping into to federal laws and would pursue that as well. Uh, tougher sentences, background checks, all of them are necessary. So how do I put this in the context of uh, an overall agenda? for our safety and security. So it begins with that Massachusetts is surrounded by a lot of states with um, uh, much more permissive gun laws. So I would need to work with other governors uh, around New England uh, and to ensure the stop of the traffic of guns uh, and to ensure or hope that they work with their state legis legislators to buttress at least the sort of transfer of guns and ammunition, which sometimes, uh, like in New Hampshire, for example, can come to the harm of Massachusetts. Uh, second, uh, this is a public health issue. I, uh, there is lawful ownership of guns. Uh, there is also just, uh, just totally irresponsible behavior. Uh, so we need to begin to talk seriously about the responsibility of gun ownership. That includes having gun locks. That includes not cleaning your gun when your children are around. Those are the things we also have to talk about so that gun ownership uh, can be protected as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Avalon. I started out my adult life as a surgeon and uh, unfortunately took care of um, too many, often young people that came uh, to the hospital and died or almost died or were left maimed in many ways uh, because of gun violence. So it's not just these mass murders that we think about and that, we, that the, the legislation has uh, been targeting, but our cities are swimming in guns uh, and handguns. And so um, much more attention to youth violence in our cities. I spent five different weekends walking in neighborhoods where youth had been killed in the last, uh, within weeks, and saw the fear and the paralysis in those neighborhoods. So I, I support all the four measures you mentioned, including the uh, increased disclosure uh, around mental health for people that may have uh, dangerous tendencies. But I also know that to really get at this problem, we have to decrease youth uh, violence in the cities, and there are things that we have to put back that we know worked there before. Summer jobs, reentry programs, gang diversion programs, uh, and, and the like, uh, and we have to get back to that in many of the cities in the Commonwealth. Mr. Berwick. I'm a pediatrician, and uh, weapons of war have no place on our streets. Uh, 7,000 kids, 20 a day, have gunshot injuries in our country. 3,000 never make it to the emergency room. Uh, I think, I don't remember exactly the total, but the number of gunshot injuries we have in our country are more per capita than the next 15 countries combined. Uh, it's, we need strong federal legislation on this. We need to stand behind that at the federal level because we need the help at the state level to get these, to get guns under control. We need a backbone in Congress. Uh, at the state level, we have strong gun, we have strong gun laws. Uh, we need to keep them and strengthen them. Mental health services really count. And I want to also weigh in on the gang violence issue. Uh, we can really do something about that. One of the most incredible meetings I've had as a candidate so far has been with Reverend David Wright with the Black Ministerial Alliance in Boston, who now is putting together a consortium of, of civil society organizations trying to work on gang violence, and it's going to work. I can watch the will built there to help young people avoid the, the hazards. I, I must tell you of a, of, of a child I had who had leukemia. We cured it, and while his brother got sh killed by a gunshot through the front door of his house. Ms. Coakley. So we have the toughest gun laws in the country in Massachusetts, and we have too many guns coming in from other New England states or from southern states. And so dealing with that issue, uh, to me, is two sorts of people who shouldn't have guns. People who are criminals, so they have criminal intent, and they're going to shoot. We've already had nine homicides in Boston this year. Uh, in the hands of people who shouldn't have guns, 
Uh, and we also have to deal with uh, the ways in which we do appropriate threat assessment of those people who, because of a behavioral mental illness, are dangerous. There's no statistic that says people who are uh, mentally ill are more dangerous than others, but there are a certain number of people, if we do not do the appropriate threat assessment, are dangerous, like an Adam Lanza, uh, or others that we know about that often end up in suicides as well as murders. We do need a federal assault ban. There's no other way around it. We, we ban it in Massachusetts. We need federal legislation to change that piece. And Mr. Grossman. I'm just going to keep my answer to the question, which was about Massachusetts uh, legislation. And I think all of those provisions make a lot of sense. Uh, but, and I would add to that storage of weapons, uh, gun safety locks, as Juliet said, and the new technologies around fingerprints so that only the owner of that gun can fire that weapon, which would, I think, have a big impact on child safety in so many ways. Uh, I want to applaud our uh, District Attorney Dave Sullivan, who's here tonight, because on the issues of drugs and guns and our relationship with other communities, other states, he's working on this flow of drugs and guns because he knows that it's affecting so many people in the two counties where he's responsible. And um, finally, it, it seems to me that as governor, you have an obligation to use your legal authority and your moral authority uh, to deal with this issue of guns and gun violence. But at the same time, there are people in Western Massachusetts who own weapons, who are law-abiding people, who store them properly, and I want to make sure that those people who do own those weapons are not unduly targeted because they are lawful people I'm and sorry. the ownership of guns is important to them. They should be protected. Thank you. Question now from Laura Hutchinson. We'll go first to Mr. Avalone. Okay. When we were backstage uh, before the forum tonight, we sort of made a joke uh, thanking you, and of course we're very appreciative for you to make the drive out west to talk to us tonight. Um, however, if you are elected governor, everyone in this room is going to want to know that you are here in Western Mass engaging in our local issues. So as governor, how do you plan to make yourself readily available to everyone here in Western Mass? And in your research, what sort of specific issues have you already found to be prevalent in Hamden, Hampshire, Franklin, and Berkshire counties? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yes, I am uh, running as hard as I can to be uh -huh. governor of the whole state because I think we are a one state. And I think if we uh, allow things to proceed over the next decade as they have been, we're gonna end up with uh, haves and have-nots in our state that is beyond the Massachusetts that we really want. And that means regions really not being able to keep up. And I think that's part of the western part of the state as well. As wonderful as, as so many parts of it are, the gateway cities that are here are behind. They need jobs. So the first thing is jobs throughout the Commonwealth. And jobs based on new job skills using our community and state colleges in a way that will bring the new businesses here. This has been my experience running a large global operation that Companies and new businesses will go where the work skills are. So making sure that in the western part of our state, uh, the state and community colleges and vocational schools have the skills for modern uh, businesses to make sure that we can bring them here. I think that's the number one job for the governor. Uh, in addition, the infrastructure. We know that we do need to improve the infrastructure and we have many needs around the Commonwealth, but some are certainly in the western part of the state. And in particular, what I've heard was increasing the amount of money for uh, the regional transit authorities here. It's clear that the economy gets delayed and the quality of life deteriorates if people can't get from town to town in the western part of the state. I also think connecting the state better with commuter rail has certainly got to be part of our future and that certainly would mean from Springfield uh, at least uh, into, um, uh, into Boston uh, in a bigger way. So I think there's a variety of ways, but infrastructure, jobs in particular, uh, and, um, uh, and in the case of infrastructure, up upgrading the RTA that in Time. all these regions. Out Time, here. sir. Thank you. Mr. Berwick. Given the kind of place I grew up in a rural uh, town, uh, this, this part of the state actually is, feels more comfortable with me. I love it out here, and you will see a lot of me out here as governor. I absolutely guarantee that. I'm hearing interesting and wonderful issues here, all of which are tractable. The high-speed internet issue here, it's, ready to, it's time to solve it completely throughout the western part of the state. Uh, I see tourism development as a particularly important uh, possibility here, even beyond the, the already beautiful developments that are in place. The unemployment issues that Joe mentioned, uh, you can't visit this, the cities out here without seeing the need to, to grow the jobs, especially as part of the economy. I know you're strongly invested in agriculture and farming, and I think building local agriculture and local farming 
There's a tremendous opportunity out here. The transportation issues, I think, are severe. That's both east-west and north-south. I think some very interesting western corridor ideas here and central corridor ideas for developing rail linkages, and I really think those may pay off in terms of investments, and I very much want to take care of, to take a close look at those and, and, uh, and move, move forward on them. And then lastly, I'll say with health care, developing rural health care can be a template for the rest of the state. You know what continuity looks like, and we need that throughout the state. So it's a wonderful area of development, and you'll have my heart. Time, sir. Thank you. Ms. Coakley. So I grew up in Berkshire County in North Adams. My dad moved our family out there after he sold insurance out of Springfield, and the five of us grew up. Uh, and I know from my experience and his there, running his own business, being involved in his church and chamber of commerce, that when the economy goes down here, it's tougher, uh, it goes deeper, and it's tougher to come back. And I think some of the issues that are incredibly important right now do include making sure that we have broadband and we finish that last mile for the rest of this state. If you do not have that, it affects your business, your innovation, it affects whether your students um, can do their homework, and it affects whether you can even file some uh, forms with the, the uh, agencies in Massachusetts that require it. The transportation, I, I hope we're able to get that Vermonter, that uh, train through uh, from Connecticut up to Vermont, and then I think investing in regional transportation that will allow people to get around within cities and to other cities in this area is incredibly important. Thank you, Mr. Grossman. So for 35 years, uh, I was a small business owner before I was elected treasurer. My grandfather's business started in 1910 because of the generosity of a Springfield company. Uh, my mother went to Smith College and came back in her 25th reunion and introduced me to my wife, Barbara. I'm actually the product of an arranged marriage uh, 40, 46 years ago. I remember standing on the stage at the North Hotel Northampton in June of 1991 with John Olver, who's sitting right here, uh, in one of the most important elections this state has ever seen. So I have a strong and intimate connection with Western Massachusetts, and I've deepened that because I have a track record. As chairman of the Mass School Building Authority, we're building or have built schools in Greenfield and Springfield and East Hampton and Pittsfield and Longmeadow and Holyoke and Chicopee and right here in Northampton working with uh, Dave Narkowitz on the challenges that Smith has. So my relationship with Western Mass, I think, is a pretty direct one. And even today, when we brought 100 percent reimbursement for the two schools that were destroyed in the tornado, the Brookings and Dryden School, I was very proud of doing that for the first time in the history of the Mass School Building Authority. I look forward to continuing that relationship. Time, sir. Thank you. Ms. Kayan. There's a, a couple other uh, issues that I'd like to add uh, to this conversation. The first is we often think, oh, does, is the governor out here a lot? But I think anyone's administration and the appointments I would make as governor uh, to key leadership roles, whether it's in the arts or farming, manufacturing, transportation, have to involve uh, and, and be people from uh, this community. We, I would not be a Boston-centric uh, uh, governor in terms of appointments because uh, what are the needs out here have to be represented in a cabinet. Uh, second, broadband. It's as simple as that. It is not simply about the economy. It's about your uh, public safety and security. If you can't call the police, uh, it's a problem, and I am committed to solving it once and for all. Third, I oversaw the National Guard as the Homeland Security Advisor and have a strong relationship with the military and the National Guard. It is a vital part of who you are out here, and I will fight hard uh, to keep those investments by the Pentagon here at Otis and elsewhere uh, because so many of our communities, both veterans, but also the technology and defense industries are tied to it. Question now from Susan Kaplan. We'll go first to Mr. Berwick. Mr. Berwick uh, and friends, um, there have been numerous and serious breakdowns in state agencies quite recently from the state drug lab debacle which we're still dealing with, to the most recent trouble within the Department of Children and Families that very well may have resulted in the death of a child under that agency's supervision. The question is, what exactly would you do to lessen the chances of these kinds of problems happening again, and why do you think they happened to begin with? Uh, they are management failures and are absolutely unacceptable. Uh, state government has to function with a level of excellence and commitment to quality that would behoove uh, a highly successful business. For 30 years, quality 
executive leadership and improvement have been my main interest. What do you need to do as a leader that establishes in a workforce a set of accountabilities, metrics, and permission to use their, their minds to do things well? What encourages a workforce to make changes? When I ran Medicare and Medicaid for the president, I was the first administrator they'd had in, in, uh, in six years. The workforce was hungry for leadership. What I brought there was a set of goals, a set of metrics, and a whole uh, array of training opportunities for the staff to begin to remind them of the importance of their mission every single day, of focusing on the needs of the, of the millions of people who depend on them, and, and personally, as a leader, training them on the methods of improvement and quality that I, that's been my mainstay for 30 years. I would bring that to state government. I want to bring Massachusetts state government throughout all of the agencies to a level of accountability and capability and pride and joy in being in the state workforce that would make us the envy of the rest of the country. That will be a central agenda for, agenda for me as governor. Ms. Coakley. So for the last 25 years or so, I've worked in one capacity or another with what was DSS and now DCF. And I have said publicly, and I've thought this for a while, that because that agency has a mission to keep families together and protect children, that mission isn't clear. And for many social workers trying to do a good job every day, uh, it's hard to do that when you walk into a home or a family that has a multitude of problems and it's not clear where you go or what you do or even what your resources are. Uh, I think that we need to have within that agency a division that's just responsible for protecting kids, that would keep track of kids and make sure that uh, if they need to be removed, they are. They would be the advocate also if it were able to go back and keep that family together. Uh, but in the court system and in the social service system, I think that is a better way to make sure we do our best for every kid. Uh, I believe that mission of keeping kids safe uh, can be at loggerheads with keeping the family together. Not always. In many instances, it isn't. Uh, in the other instance, I'm familiar with that. Our office brought criminal charges against uh, the uh, lab worker who we believed uh, had criminal conduct. Uh, I also believe there was lack of supervision and management on that, and so uh, I believe that it's important that we have great oversight and do the best we can to keep kids safe and to protect taxpayer dollars and Thank make sure defendants are treated fairly. Thank you. Mr. Grossman. So I think this is about fundamental principles of leadership. When I was sworn in as state treasurer on January 19th of 2011, I made two commitments to the people of Massachusetts. First, I said for every job I fill, I'll hire the best person because for 35 years as CEO of our family business, which grew dramatically under my leadership, we hired the best people. I said I would hire the best people. I also said the people I hired would reflect the diversity of the society in which we live. And I'm proud that 35% of the people we've hired at Treasury are people from diverse communities. But in terms of the crisis that you mentioned or the crisis at DCF, I would cite four principles. First of all, a governor has to be decisive. When a problem occurs and problems will occur, you have to step in. Number two, safety of every child. It is a tragedy of unimaginable proportions that this little boy, presumed dead, was treated the way he was. Third, accountability. Every single person has to be accountable, from the commissioner down to the person who was hired yesterday. And finally, reform. Take a look at the situation, reform the system, make sure it never happens again. Thank you, sir. Ms. Kayyem. As I said earlier, as Democrats, we should be more angry about uh, when these services fail because they uh, not only fail the individual, Jeremiah, the young child, uh, but also uh, they failed the beliefs uh, that we have about government's role. Uh, so, uh, but beyond anger, uh, all of us have been executive leaders uh, and we will tell you the honest truth stuff happens. And you judge an executive uh, not by whether the thing happened, which sometimes can't be controlled, but what we learn from it. So I am a strong advocate uh, of what might be called you know, a sort of lessons learned, of having a review, taking a deep breath, not trying to fix the bureaucracy immediately, not thinking you have the solution in the fog of politics or, or that moment, and actually stepping back and say, what can we learn from this tragedy? Uh, and then investing the resources in the examination of what we can learn and then looping back and fixing government. Government can always get better. Stuff will happen, but it can always get better and we need to learn from it. Thank you. Mr. Avalone. State government has a vital role in protecting the lives, literally in many cases, of, uh, of many of us in the case of public safety uh, or some of our most vulnerable citizens in the case of the DCF and, and some of the other services. There's no question this is a huge management failure. 
and it should not be tolerated in our state government. We shouldn't think of the state government as something that we should excuse and occasionally something bad happens. That is not correct. There are large organizations, from large hospitals to airlines, that deal with people's lives every day and they do it in a safe way. Our state government has to operate that way too. I've run very large organizations recently. Uh, I'm responsible for about 11,000 people around the world in 50 countries and what they do every day to make, uh, in this case, the, the, their jobs work, which is important in developing new drugs. We have to bring that same kind of leadership and management to the state government, and we all know the principles of it, but we have to employ them here. We should, not allow, we should not think that the state government is anything less than dealing with the lives of many, many people in our commonwealth, and that's the kind of culture we have to instill in it, and I will. Thank you, sir. That's the final question from our yeah. panel of journalists. We thank them for their help this evening. We turn now to the questions that were presented in advance to the candidates, their campaigns. They're listed in your programs, the community questions. And uh, the next question, go first to Ms. Coakley. It comes from Tim Carpenter, Executive Director of Progressive Democrats of America. As, <laughs> as governor, what concrete steps will you take to advance a constitutional amendment to overturn the Citizens United ruling and to support other key reforms to defend the basic promise of government of, by, and for the people. Ms. Coakley. Well, as Attorney General, I've already taken those steps because I have uh, organized and worked with other Attorneys General to make sure we do what we need to do to overturn this decision, which is amend the Constitution. That's a long, arduous process. We need your help in doing it, by the way, because we need to do it state by state. We need to do it by state legislature. This decision, I believe, undercuts the very basic fabric of what we believe as a democracy and as Democrats, that your voice as an individual person is what matters, and that unless we overturn that decision and indeed require disclosure in the short run from where that money is coming from, we are going to lose our opportunity really to say we live in a democracy. I think we can't overstate uh, what that decision does. And I'm concerned that we have a Supreme Court that is cutting access from the democratic process as well as access to courts for individuals who seek redress in a criminal or in a civil context. Uh, so you all need to work with us to make sure that we change that. Mr. Grossman. I have no doubt that we all would work very hard to overturn Citizens United. We need to do that. I think there's a consensus. I can't see the crowd because of the lights, but I don't think a hand would go up <laughs> if we asked whether there was somebody here who thinks Citizens United is a good idea. Uh, I'm on the record over the years, both as chairman of the Democratic National Committee and as a citizen, uh, favoring public financing of campaigns. I wish we had gone that route. We should. I also oversee the state's public pension system. We have $57 billion of stock in 9,000 companies, and we actually changed our proxy voting guidelines back in 2011, and I was proud to have led that effort to make sure that any company, any company in which we own stock and spends shareholders' money for political purposes that's not fully disclosed or that done, is done at all, we should vote against that company. We should let those boards of directors know that it's not acceptable to use shareholders' money, taxpayers' money, to do that. And finally, I was the first candidate for the Democratic nomination of governor who suggested a people's pledge. A people's pledge just like the one that Ed Markey and Stephen Lynch signed. If we can keep unregulated money out of this race, that would be a good thing, and I hope we can all get that pledge signed. And let's sign it tonight. Thank you very much. Ms. Kayyem. Yes, like the treasurer, I don't think there's much debate about uh, the substance here. Uh, as a new candidate, uh, I can't tell you uh, how horrible money is in the system. Uh, and I would be for public financing of campaigns as well. Uh, for someone trying to start a campaign, uh, it is all about money. And that is unfortunate, because that's not why people like me run for governor. So just to give you a sense of how it has infiltrated us. So how do we fight back absent a constitutional amendment? One is the vote still works. And one of my goals in this campaign is to energize uh, 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 the base and young people who, who believe in public service, but just don't vote, right? That's a gap that that's our failing. And so to engage them in the process, because uh, voting will get more people of their generation and more progressives in office. Uh, secondly, if I am governor, I am sure to try hard and work hard to make sure that our Supreme Court justices, uh, the next Supreme Court justices um, are uh, progressive, uh, and that will require a Democratic governor, a Democratic president in uh, 2016. I look forward to seeing her. <laughs> 
<laughs> Mr. Avalone. Well, Citizens United is an abomination. It's not only going to lead to bad politics, it's going to ultimately lead to bad government. And we have to do everything we can to, to uh, reverse it if that takes a uh, constitutional amendment uh, of the federal constitution. Uh, I would certainly do everything we need to do to back that uh, at the federal level and then certainly ratify it uh, uh, you know, at the state level when the time comes. Um, I do believe that uh, money controls too much of local politics as well. Uh, when Steve was floating the idea of the People's Pledge, I, th I think we all agree with that. Uh, certainly we don't want uh, outside money here, but I think we should go farther. I put out a press release this summer asking that we go farther, that we limit PACs and, register and uh, registered lobbyist donations in our state. I don't have full agreement from some of our colleagues on that, but I think this is where we need to go in the future in order to have people's faith in government restored. Right now, they don't think the system's working for them. They think the system is rigged by special interests. Mr. Berwick. I think Citizens United is the most toxic element of public policy that our country has seen in a century. Uh, I saw it work in Washington in my time in the administration, the way that money talks and controls uh, special interests over public interests uh, was stunning. I fought it every day, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, but we need to overturn Citizens United. We need our state behind a constitutional amendment, as I think we all agree. As governor, I would work very hard with other states to get as many states as possible on this very important trajectory. Meanwhile, back here, we can work on election participation. That's key. I fully support the bill now, the bill's now being considered for uh, early voting and for election day registration. In any way, we can make it easier for people to participate in the democracy. Voices can overcome the toxicity of money if we mobilize those voices. As far as a pledge goes, my staff well know I will agree to any pledge that my colleagues all agree upon. <laughs> Our next question goes first to Mr. Grossman. It comes from Phil Corman, Executive Director in Sustaining Agriculture, CISA. What state policies would you advocate to ensure that local farms thrive and that all residents have access to fresh and healthy local food? Well, the good news is in the last 14 years, we've seen a roughly 25% increase in local farms here in Massachusetts. So there are some good things going on. Uh, as governor, I think you can do a number of things. First, uh, year-round farmers markets would certainly promote local food and local produce. I salute the Agricultural Commission here in Northampton for the efforts they have undertaken to increase access to fresh food for lower income people. We should take some of those recommendations, some of those best practices, and promote them all over the Commonwealth. But I think we can promote local food, locally grown food and produce by making sure that we try hard in our schools, in our colleges, in our universities, in our hospitals, and in public institutions to use locally grown food, locally grown, grown produce. Uh, I was in the marketing communications business for 35 years, and if a governor gets behind an effort, a comprehensive effort, to promote locally grown food all over the Commonwealth on behalf of the farmers, we can not only improve the health of our citizens, but also improve our economy and create That's jobs, right. particularly in the farms of the western counties of the state. Thank you. Ms. Kayan. So, of course, I would uh, support farmers markets and farm to table initiatives, but the challenge here is uh, a little bit about logistics, is how do we uh, support farms to get the food to the tables? And so we need to support a variety of efforts that are already being tried out in your communities, uh, shared car services, uh, the capability of uh, public farmers markets, uh, farmers markets that are close to schools so that parents who might not be able to get to farmers markets further away, all sorts of creative initiatives because it's always that last mile, right? It's not the farming or that we know that people need to eat it, right? It is just getting it to the table. So I'm committed to that. Secondly, working with USDA, uh, we get a lot of grants here uh, and we need to continue to pursue them to get people to understand that Massachusetts is an agriculture uh, state. And finally, in the public health issue, uh, this is uh, about what our kids are putting in their systems. So to ensure that schools have access to fresh food uh, for their children is of utmost importance uh, in the years ahead. Thank you. Mr. Avalone. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity. It's terrific that sustainable agriculture is becoming a bigger part of, uh, of Massachusetts in the western part of the state. It's always been part of our history. But I am going to be publishing uh, my health care policy soon, and it'll have a big public health co component to it. And childhood obesity is one of the things that I'm going to highlight. The biggest thing that I think we can do for sustainable agriculture 
is to work on childhood obesity in the way that I'm going to propose with much more widespread education, certainly uh, better nutritious foods in the schools, which can come from the western part of the state, and also community-based programs uh, like has occurred in some parts of the eastern Massachusetts in Somerville and in parts of Boston where there are vouchers for healthy foods, uh, prescriptions by doctors for healthy foods, and community uh, focused programs that uh, bring healthy foods into uh, urban environments. I think by tying these two things together, it improves the economy of agriculture and in the meantime, saves lives ultimately in taking on the issue of childhood obesity, which is all about unhealthy foods. Thanks. Mr. Berwick. I think it's an exciting topic and the wealth you have out here in the western part of the state in agriculture is a real treasure for the Commonwealth. I'd love to see you develop it further. I know you need some help with infrastructure to do that. You'd have my support. As I say, I grew up in a small town. My father was a general practitioner there. He made house calls, and he was sometimes paid in chickens or eggs or produce. So I really know what farm-to-table looks like, I guarantee. <laughs> as a pediatrician interested, as Joe is, in, in, in childhood obesity, it's, a, it's an epidemic. And we've got to work on nutrition as a mainstay for the improvement of our health and public health system. And this is one way to do it with local food production and healthy, <coughs> healthy foods. Um, I want to make one comment about low-income populations. These problems are multiplied in low-income settings where obesity and poor nutrition and food deserts are a serious problem. We need to increase the access that our low-income populations have, children and adults, to good food, and I want to do that, and I totally favor the use of EBT cards at favorable rates in farmers' markets. Ms. Coakley. So this is an area where it's important who you appoint to be the Commissioner of Agriculture and who's on your staff and who's in your cabinet. And if I am governor, I would make sure um, that we do continue the exciting stuff that is going on out here on agriculture. One of the issues, obviously, is what is the uh, expansion involved? How much could you uh, grow here if you had the other piece of it, which is the storage facilities that you need, uh, for instance, uh, more d uh, in investment in dairy farming capacity, and then the transportation issue. How do you get it from the farms here to the rest of the state or to other states? And so if we're able to do that, and I think we are, you need a governor and uh, cabinet members and a commissioner who will invest in that. There are also the ways in which we would create the network for entrepreneurial farming, for making sure that smart farming and the ways in which we can use technology to increase that yield and the ways we get it around. Uh, and finally, I would ask Steve Grossman how we would um, finance it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to answer that real quickly? No. Or would no, that's not? No. Okay. <laughs> Let me answer for you. No. No, that's okay. <laughs> Our, our next uh, question will go first to Ms. Kayem, and uh, it comes from Jim Ayers, Executive Director, United Way of Hampshire County. What concrete steps would your administration take to reverse the trend in which, first, the Commonwealth's investment in human services and education is being reduced, and second, there is divestment in preventive services? Well, uh, thank you for the question because I think the answer, one, one, the fundamental answer is increasing the minimum wage. Uh, people fall into the need of social services that, who's, that are being limited uh, because they're, they have no buffer, right? Because they're just barely surviving. They're working two jobs. Uh, both family members are working jobs. And so what, the, what raising the minimum wage is actually about is it is about us as a whole being prepared for the challenges ahead. So to me, that question begins with, uh, the minimum wage, but it doesn't end there. Uh, there are partnerships between school systems, higher education, uh, private sector that are filling the gap where we can't, where government can't. I have spent my career uh, thinking how to put the pieces together. And sometimes government's not always the solution. I was in Worcester and met with the uh, African uh, Community Education Group, ACE, uh, that is you know, you know, global problems, refugees coming to Worcester who are being uh, supported by the private sector, by the schools, by the high school, by the college and others to commit, to, to keep people engaged in society. So there are creative ways we can deal with this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Avalon. Yes, we have big needs, and certainly education and, and, the, uh, and the retreat that we've seen in human services during the recession are two big ones. We have to invest in education. That is our future. That's the future of our children. And we also have to put back in place some of the safety net that was there for human services, including those things that prevent um, more, worse outcomes for vulnerable people and, and, uh, and much higher costs for the state overall. I don't think we need to raise taxes to do that. What we need to do is control our health care costs. 
these numbers are so large that we lose track of the fact that small changes in the health care uh, costs can have huge changes for the state budget. As I said before, it's 40 percent of the state budget. That's up from 20 percent 12 years ago, and it continues to rise. If we save 1 percent, that's $350 million a year, a billion dollars over three years that could go a long way towards improving our education system and putting back in place uh, these human services uh, preventive measures that have been stripped away during the recession and the tight times that we've had. This is the way we need to go. Mr. Berwick. It, it worries me very, very deeply to see my nation backing away from the moral commitment to human services for people who need help, and I think this state needs to be a beacon that reverses that trend. Uh, the problem is partly health care costs. They are simply taking resources from the other investments we need to make in supports to people, and we can fix that. The single-payer idea is one, and health care reform, delivery reform is key. We need to reassert the moral commitment to this kind of help without apology, without Masking it, just saying helping people when they need help is a moral commitment of our commonwealth. It's the kind of place we want to be. And lastly, I think realizing these are investments. They're much more than they are expenses. When a person's headed for prison, we are headed for major, major public expenses that can be averted with mental health services and interception and supports that keep people with hope in their lives. When a person has mental illness that's not treated, that's a person headed for forms of disability and inability that will cost us dearly. It's just smart to provide services. As far as prevention goes, I'm a pediatrician. You have me at hello. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Coakley. This, this is a real tough question for a minute, so I can't answer everything. I've spent a lot of my life working on preventing crime and getting kids uh, back into school. And uh, agree with Don that one of the things we need to look at is making sure, I believe, that we spend more money on education and rehabilitation than we do on incarceration. And as a former DA and AG, I have some credibility around that. I think we can do that here in Massachusetts. So let's just talk about what we might do with kids and services that we need to fund. So in addition to everything we talked about in education, uh, for pre-K and for uh, a longer school day and uh, making Vogue Tech schools available for kids so they have jobs. I think it's important, and we could do this here with a realigned DCF to make sure that kids in our schools have the social services they need. If they come to school hungry, if they come to school with behavioral disorders, if they come to school with abuse, and do it in an effective way that aligns our mission of keeping kids uh, out of trouble and giving them what they need before they get into trouble. It's one way to make sure that we invest where we should. Mr. Grossman. So I think that it is important that we know and understand, and I think we all do, that you judge a society by how it spends its resources. We've got a budget which has been proposed for fiscal 15 of roughly $36 billion. That's a lot of money. It's an increase of about 5% over the previous year. That's also a lot of money. So I find it almost incomprehensible that almost 500 children and families and adults would be losing vital mental health and behavioral health services in this current budget that would allow them and enable them to live independently. I think we need to make sure that even in an environment of limited resources and a 5% increase is not so limited, that we make sure that the most vulnerable people in our society are protected. That is our first responsibility. That is our most important responsibility. And that's what running for governor and being a leader is all about. Thank you, sir. Our next community question comes from Jim Credinier, Executive Director, Stavro Center for Independent Living. It will go first to Mr. Avalone. The personal care attendant program which allows more than 27,000 people with disabilities and frail elders to live independently in our communities is funded with Medicaid dollars with both the Commonwealth and federal governments covering its costs. Could you tell us how you view the importance of this program and what steps you might take to protect it in the face of financial pressures? I think it's a vitally important program. Uh, both personally and professionally, I, I believe that. Uh, my mother is now entering the, the age where she is uh, becoming a frail elder, and the companion care that uh, we've tried as a family to provide for her is absolutely critical to her ability to live independently and maintain the quality of life and actually better health. 
So I believe that this is what we should also seek for many other people in our state, and I completely agree with this program. But I also think it'll be in a bigger and part of, and more important part of the new kinds of coordinated care systems that will come about when we change the way our health care is delivered and have doctors work in teams. The coordination of, of care for the elder uh, to keep them out of the hospital, to keep them out of institutions is an incredibly important part, not only to keep their quality of life, uh, but also their health so that they don't end up repeatedly coming back into the hospital, uh, which is not great for them, terrible for them, and hugely costly for our health care system overall. So I think this is a, one of the real keys for improvement in our system. Thank you, sir. Mr. Berwick. This is a great opportunity to envision the health care system we really want and we really need. Just um, imagine that you're a person with a disability or that you're a frail elder. What do you want? I want to be home with my loved ones, to live as long and with as much uh, capacity and, and, and investment in, in the things I enjoy in my life as possible. I don't want to be in a hospital bed or in a nursing home. Luckily, we now have models in our nation about how to move people from institutions to homes. As CMS administrator, I got to implement some of the most exciting parts of the Affordable Care Act as we move people from institutional to home-based settings. Those depend on a workforce capable of keeping people at high levels of function in home, including personal care attendance. And we need to invest in that reallocation of resources so those people have the support to support the people who want to be home, and they need wages that are living wages. We need to make sure that this part of the workforce gets represented in our economy the, the way their work intends to be uh, should, should be represented, and I support the labor unions that are trying to get rights to these workers. Ms. Ms. Coakley. So PCAs are great. I think they're a fabulous way to accomplish so many things that we want to do that, that the, those who have already spoken, I think, have spoken eloquently about that. Uh, I had the chance to uh, be a PCA for a day, to walk in their shoes. Uh, it is hard work. It's draining emotionally and often physically. Uh, and so Don is totally right that we need to invest in uh, those people and train them and make sure that they have the supports they need to keep, whether it's frail elders, our seniors, uh, or those who are developmentally disabled or physically disabled uh, in their homes if that's possible. I think that it does save money. It gets a better outcome. Um, and we always have the challenges of making sure that they're accountable and that uh, we don't see uh, fraud and abuse in this, so we have to manage that as we always do in state systems. But I think it's uh, very much worth it. I think it's one of the best things we've done in um, uh, keeping uh, track of some of our most, uh, uh, most of our frail and uh, um, vulnerable people in our society. Mr. Grossman. So here's an area where I think the governor needs to play a leadership role and balance off but really focus on the needs of these individuals. Uh, there was a new national program um, which took place last summer. Uh, there were many insurance companies that we expected to sign up to support this program. Many of them backed away because they felt that they couldn't make any money doing it. And the number of people who maybe cut off that program declined by almost 20,000 people. So I think it's up to the governor to sit down with the insurers who play a critical role in the funding and financing of this and find a way to get to yes so that none, and I mean none, of the vulnerable people who are frail or disabled, not all of whom are older, but all of whom have severe challenges, can continue to stay as part of this program. That's what a governor does. That's what leadership is all about. That's what I would do. Ms. Kayan. So I'm just at the age when I'm starting to think about these issues for my parents. And when I asked them how they wanted me to think about it, many of you have had these difficult conversations. They first denied that it would ever happen to them, uh, but then uh, said they just wanted to feel like they still belonged. Um, and that meant home. And I understood that. So I would support and continue to support uh, uh, the implementation of these programs that give uh, individuals uh, a choice uh, for where, how they want to spend their lives. Uh, and we have to be committed to that because of the second uh, issue that we have to address. That that people with disabilities or even the elderly are still very active contributors to our society. And so we shouldn't just view it as uh, how do we, you know, sort of 
uh, let them get what they want without contribution. They contribute in so many ways, whether it's care uh, for grandchildren or whether it's uh, entering the workforce or uh, helping in communities. And so by having a variety of health care plans and choices, uh, we can promote their belonging in society for as long as possible. Thank you very much. We have now reached the final question of the evening, and it comes from our organizing committee. It will go first to Mr. Berwick. The Federal Secure Communities Program was expanded statewide over Governor Patrick's opposition. The number of Massachusetts immigrants with no criminal record who have been deported far exceeds the national average. In the absence of congressional action, what would be your response as governor to this fingerprint sharing program and its impact on Massachusetts families? Well, we're, we're a nation of immigrants. It's what made us great. Uh, to walk away from the benefits of diversity that people can bring to us in our communities. It's not smart, it's not compassionate, it's not right. This, this program is misnamed. It's not secure communities, it's insecure communities. It's a way to add uncertainty and harm to our society. Uh, I favor inclusion, welcome. If you're here, let us help you. We'll help you enter the economy, uh, have your kids enter our schools. I'm for in-state tuition for undocumented residents. Um, and, I, and I'm for fighting very, very hard for federal immigration reform now. Now is the time with a pathway to citizenship. We've got to get it done to do this, to do away with this issue as far as we can in our nation. I very much support the Trust Act that Senator Eldridge and others have put forward. It has my full support. We need to welcome and develop the contribution that people of diversity can add to our communities, and they are here among us. Let's help them. Ms. Coakley. So, I've spent a lot of time making sure that kids and women, particularly those who come from immigrant communities who may be uh, not, uh, uh, don't speak the language, or afraid to go to police, or worse, are threatened by their abusers, uh, that if they go to the police, they'll be deported. Uh, we have always in, the, in our uh, district attorney's office, and uh, uh, I think that's true across the state, treated those victims, their status does not matter. Uh, as Attorney General, I have made sure that if a company is exploiting undocumented workers, we go after the company, the status of those workers does not matter when they are victimized. My understanding is that Secure Communities was designed to make sure that dangerous people, the most violent of felons, as we want them out of communities, uh, would be deported when the facts justified it. And if that is not how the program is working, um, then that needs to change. And I would work with our local police to make sure that our, all of our communities feel safe, our undocumented and others who are here. Mr. Grossman. So this is an area where I absolutely, completely agree with Governor Patrick. Uh, but it is the law of the country and we need to implement this as best we can. It's highly flawed. Unlike the Attorney General who hailed the Secure Communities Program, when it was announced, and who supported uh, and who opposed in-state tuition for undocumented people, at least back in 2010, and opposed uh, driver's license for undocumented people, which is a public safety issue, and I support driver's licenses for undocumented people as a public safety issue. I think it's important that a governor try to work with federal authorities and work with legislators, as Don Berwick just suggested, to make sure that the downside of secure communities is changed in a way that comports with the law but still protects those people. We are sending far too many people away, deporting them for very low level offenses in ways that divide families and send families away and are deeply divisive without protecting the Commonwealth <coughs> and all of its people. That should end. Ms. Kayyem. Uh, I was with the governor uh, during a raid in New Bedford by the immigration services that detained over 200 uh, women and mothers and saw the devastation that these aggressive immigration uh, mandates were putting on our communities. I uh, was part of President Obama's uh, uh, team uh, to push for comprehensive immigration reform, which I believe is still possible uh, uh, with bipartisan support and believe that it can happen in the next two years. I am also the daughter of an immigrant family. Uh, I get this. Uh, and uh, Secure Communities is broken. Uh, 
The reason why it's broken is because anyone who's been in public safety knows that actually the best form of law enforcement is one in which you engage the communities that you are a part of as a law enforcement official. That means uh, having immigrants feel free to come forward, having women who are abused feel free to come forward without being deported. And secure communities undermines that, what we have learned in public safety after the last 30 or 40 years. I am committed to ending it uh, and will do everything as governor uh, to minimize its impact. Impact. Thank you, Mr. Avalone. Well, we're all from immigrant families, and certainly uh, Massachusetts has a glorious history of immigrants from the beginning, essentially build what we are today as a commonwealth, and will be so in the future as well. Immigrants will always be and should be a big part of our future. But let's face it, this is a botched program, and if we can't fix it, we should get rid of it. It was meant to, to uh, allow local police to have access to fingerprints so they could see uh, hardened criminals uh, and then start uh, who happen to be immigrants and start deportation uh, proceedings. That's good. That should happen. If that's the, all that it was doing, then I would be for it. The fact that lots of immigrants are living in fear of being pulled over for a minor traffic violation uh, because they could believe that they could be on their way to being deported, this is not worth it. This is a failure. This is causing fear uh, like it's a police state uh, for these poor people. So we need to either fix this so the database really works so that it only is, uh, shows who hardened criminals are or get rid of it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Time now for closing statements. <clears throat> Excuse me, one minute each. We begin with Ms. Coakley. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. You have some great choices ahead of you, not just for this office, but for other offices, and your engagement is crucial. I'm running for governor because I want to make sure that people like Kate Reynolds, a teacher whose husband was injured lost his income, uh, had medical bills they couldn't pay, and fought for 18 months with Wells Fargo to try and get a loan modification in their home until they came to our office and we were able to get that loan modification and keep in her home, prevent that insecurity. I'm running for governor for all of our kids who deserve the best education from beginning to end and the opportunity to compete in a global economy. And I'm running for governor because I think it's really important that as we look at all of our health care issues across Massachusetts, that we continue to bring costs down, but provide good, effective health care for people. We also reduce the stigma around mental health and behavioral health. We provide access and pay for it as the law requires. That will be a better Massachusetts. I, I want your help and your vote. Thank you. Mr. Grossman. So our good friend Deval Patrick gave his final address, State of the Commonwealth address, last night. In it he said, Massachusetts is in the leadership business. It reminded me of a conversation that I had with Bill Clinton 17 years ago. I was chairman of the Democratic National Committee. We were in Philadelphia. I had a few minutes with him. I said, Mr. President, what's your most important job as president? He looked at me without a moment's hesitation and said, Steve, I'm in the solutions business. I give a lot of speeches to a lot of people, but I'm here to solve problems. That couldn't be a better way to describe me. I've been in the solutions business all my life, in business, in politics, in philanthropy, and as your state treasurer for the last three years. That's the job of a governor, to be in the solutions business, to leave no one behind, to bring jobs and economic security to every region of the Commonwealth. If you give me that opportunity, Solving the problems and bringing us together and leaving no community behind will be my principal goal. I look forward to working with you. Look forward to being with you at the caucuses in the next month. Look forward to every step of the way all the way to November. Thank you. Ms. Kahn. I am the daughter of an immigrant family, and my grandmother came here, nine children, 32 grandchildren, of which I'm just one, and to her dying day, she carried around a Ziploc bag that had the papers of her journey, her uh, citizenship forms, the passport, the nine birth certificates of her children. And she used to, whenever you questioned her, never learned to read or write English, she would pull out that Ziploc bag and she would say, I belong, I belong. I never got that until I got much older uh, and understood what Massachusetts is about and what uh, it has offered me as uh, coming here for school, meeting a guy, uh, interfaith marriage, three kids, raising them here, great opportunities uh, to work in state government. Uh, that there is no uh, 
political class here in Massachusetts. There is no next in line. What we can bring uh, for each other is a commitment that everyone belongs uh, to this state and to the journey that we will uh, build uh, together. We can be the most welcoming and the most prepared and the most connected state if we all belong to that mission. So I am grateful to all of you uh, for belonging to it too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avalon. I've been running to try to be your governor uh, for a year, 129 cities and towns and over 400 events. And the people I've seen are telling me that politics as usual isn't working for them, that the needs of the middle class aren't being met. I'm not a Beacon Hill politician. And this is really no time for politics as usual. The next governor has two critical tasks to create thousands of new jobs throughout our state in a competitive world economy and control our health care costs, which are the highest in the world. <coughs> I'm the only candidate that's done both of those things. During my time at Blue Cross, we controlled health care costs. And running a large global organization, we created thousands of jobs, including many in here in Massachusetts. I know I can be the bold leader that we need now to move our Commonwealth into the 21st century. And I'd love to have your support. And thank you for your time tonight. And Mr. Berwick. Thanks for your commitment. I'm a progressive. I believe the government has an essential role in helping us make the communities and the Commonwealth that we want. I'm with Senator Hubert Humphrey. He said, the moral test of government is how it treats people in the dawn of life, children, how it treats people in the twilight of life, the aged, and people in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and people with disabilities. Every time a mother or father goes to work for 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week and can't make ends meet, we fail the moral test. Every time a veteran returns to our shores and has no home or roof over her head, we fail the moral test. Every time a kid goes hungry, every time an elder has to choose between medicine and food, we fail the moral test. It doesn't have to be that way. The state can be a beacon, and our country badly, badly needs this. We need a governor committed to passing the moral test, and I will be that governor. Thank you. One moment, please. We need to say some quick thank yous to the Democratic Committees of Amherst, East Hampton, Northampton, Southampton, and Sunderland for organizing this evening. Again, again, let's quickly thank the Northampton High School Theater Department tech crew. They've done an amazing job. I have got to thank this very hardworking gentleman right Yay. here, Andrew, my timekeeper. Great job, thank you. We thank again our journalists, and we thank our candidates for governor, five good people for spending an evening with us. Thank you. Thank you very much.